which is coronary angiography. And why is it? Because I think you all know, uh, even if you are trying to deal with the non-invasive cardiology, coronary angiography, someone has to go undergo one time or maybe another. And still, if you talk about knowing the gold standard, what is the gold standard if you really want to visualize the coronary anatomy, coronary angiography still is the modality or the investigation for choice. So, but before you try to do any coronary angiography, you should be able to know what are its indications when you need to do as well. So before the testing, you need to do a, something called as pre-procedural evaluation, during which you try to take down the patient's history, do a physical examination. How about the earlier tests like the lab values, the ECG non-invasive studies and prior catheterizations as well. And in the tests, you should try to see, as I said it, what is the indication why this test has been asked actually? And uh, then what is the nature of presenting causes actually? Does the patient have any presenting symptoms? And is the patient intolerant to or allergic to any of the drugs like beta blocker, aspirin, benzodiazepine and these drugs? And how about any tendency for bleeding actually? And does the patient have any renal insufficiency like diabetes or even pulmonary artery disease or pulmonary COPD or stroke or peripheral vascular disease as well? Why do you need to ask all these things? Because sometimes it may happen that you're trying to give any drug to the patient and then you realize, no, the patient has all these problems. Or sometimes it may patient may have TIA when you are doing the interventional procedure actually. And that's the reason you need to be knowing whether, for example, if the patient all of a sudden develops acute hemiparesis, is it normal or the patient had it since before? So that's the reason it is better to be prepared for all these things. And then it comes as you should also try to see for the airway examination. So in the AVA examination, especially if you're trying to use conscious sedation, as I said, I try to see for the head and neck, does it have any problems? Can the patient have any problems for difficult intubation? And how about the cervical spine? Is it stable or does it, uh, the patient have any problems to open the mouth? How is the temporomandibular joint movement as well? And then the uh, also, does the have patient have any congenital abnormalities in the craniofacial region or the, did the patient had any neck surgeries or if the patient had any prior interventional cath lab procedures why is it important to know if the patient had any prior cath lab procedures so that you will be sure you want to also calculate the dosage of radiations which the patient has had received actually, okay? And then, of course, the dental history and the oral cavity, if there are any missing or chipped tooth actually, and is there any other problem as well? Now, coming to the, just immediately before the procedures. So what happens is, it is better to ask the patient to avoid any solid food after the midnight. But why you have to know the procedural history? Anyone can guess? Try to think about the reason. What is the possible reason for this? Of course, of course. I will speak to you in half an hour. I will speak. Call you half an hour after half an hour. So, what is the reason? No guesses. So, because as I said uh, it, sir, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Post, post procedure nausea and vomiting. Right, 
right right those things and even radiations tend to accumulate in the sense if someone has undergone a procedure like a week back so if you had given like two grays two not milligram telling two grays 2.5 grays and you are trying to repeat the procedure like in yeah two to three days itself you need to be a bit careful and because if you give him like two to three grays more you are going to worsen the situation you know what up to more than five grays can be lethal to a patient so you need to be a little bit careful for that as well and then uh, what happens is yeah you can say it like this so especially three to four hours you can give some clear liquids before the procedure, uh, uh, before the procedure okay and then you should always try to give clear instructions to the patient is nothing nil per oral um, and then initially the best way is you should try to give a intravenous infusion of 0.9 percent nsel why you are trying to put up an iv infusion for the patient is because if you want to give any other remaining drug as well if you want to sedate the patient if there is any emergency as well you can try to give that medicine so what or when do you think for contrast in enhanced or induced nephropathy or what do you do in such kind of cases any guesses The city and geography. Ah, huh, sorry. The city and geography. Right, right. So what happens is, if you have induced contrast as well, it takes a little bit of time for the contrast to, you know, uh, be passed out, especially through your kidneys. So that's why you have to be a little bit careful. So if someone has already been, his serum creatinine is a bit borderline or little raised you should try to give them uh, this is what is called renal protection protocol we will discuss in the coming sessions later on and yeah if someone has had allergy to contrast you can give them prednisone 60 milligram by mouth the night before and the morning of the procedure so you have to give it at least twice evening before or the night before and again in the morning and later on, you can also give diphenhydramine 50 mg by mouth or IV just before the procedure. You may also consider for an oral sedative just before the procedure, which is benzodiazepine. If the patient is really uncomfortable, making noise, not so cooperative as well. So now coming to what are the indications for coronary angiography? So as we all know, class 1 is definitely, uh, so what happens is you need to know what happens is yeah when you are trying to really suspect if someone may be having a coronary artery disease. So those are the cases definitely you should do coronary angiography. Angiography should not be indicated for someone who is having healthy, asymptomatic and without any problems. You are just putting up the, you want to do you know visualize the coronary arteries that's not the way to go there are classes of indication for that and even in those things just before you take up a procedure for a patient actually you should be able to see all these lab values as well serum potassium creatinine hemoglobin they all need to be in normal range after that as we all know interventional uh, cardiology or even EP as well it's a interventional procedure after all so there are complications which may happen one of the most common complication is what is the most common complication the hematoma. great great <laughs> so so as you all know the local uh, problems what is called is vascular access problems then after that contrast allergy renal failure may also happen but sometimes infections perforations nerve injury and pulmonary embolism may also happen as you may see beautifully in this diagram so you can see is these are the different coronary arteries and also the veins so the normal theorem is 
if there is an artery there will be an accompanying vein as well and that's what happens with most of these major branches so as you can see the major veins here are great cardiac vein then comes anterior cardiac vein and then is the small cardiac vein and these are the arteries arteries the branches are so this is what is the the big branch especially on the right side is right coronary artery which further gives a anterior branch okay and this further gives branches also to the SA node so you should be really careful where the SA node is there so literally where the superior vena cava is originating that's where you may get those branches because a lot of times whenever you are doing interventions so that's the reason if a patient is having RCA block and all as well then the patient may be having all these problems okay so this is what is the biggest coronary artery which is called as left main coronary artery and later on later on you see is left anterior descending and left circumflex and of course which will be you can see LED giving off to diagonal branches you can name them further as D1 D2 D3 and all however the left circumflex will be giving further branches as which is called as obtuse marginal so if you are trying to see on a fluoroscopic plane how does it look like so this is how it seems so if you've seen the atrioventricular plane and the interventricular plane atrioventricular plane is between the atrium and the ventricle however the interventricular plane is between the ventricles so that's why as i was telling you which you can see so the left main comes over here and then you get the LAD which further gives rise to diagonals and the left, left circumflex which gives rise to further obtuse marginal and the RCA branches RCA branches gives rise to what is the name of the branch which comes out from RCA anyone so already the hint is here PD great great super and also the sinus node right so this is another view so earlier we were seeing the you know sternal view and now this is the diaphragmatic view diaphragmatic view is like you know the heart is kept so when you are trying to see from the below what are you going to see so this is the great cardiac vein and these all are the branches of the coronary sinus coronary sinus is the one coronary uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy in form of a pacer or defibrillator CRTD or CRTP these are the sub further sub branches of the coronary sinus which you have to target actually and as I as a simple rule all the cath labs everywhere in the world they all have to follow some fundamentals and what are the fundamentals is x-ray source is commonly under the table and the image intensifier is the one which is lying above the patient the body surface of the patient that faces the image in intensifier or flat panel determines the specific view and this relationship holds true whether patient is spine standing or rotated and that's the reason if you want to obtain an oblique view which is angulated from the perpendicular view the image intensifiers move towards the patient left shoulder towards the left shoulder or to the patient's right side and thus moving the left shoulder forward produces the LAO view and towards the right shoulder forward produces the RAO view so like any standard field or specialization here in coronary angiography there are some nomenclature there are some names for that so there is a AP position anteroposterior RAO right anterior oblique LAO left anterior oblique and cranial position or caudal position cranial as you all can know so it is towards the head of the patient if the image intensifier is towards the head side then it is cranial caudal is 
tilted towards the feet of the patient. So the things what I was speaking to, you can see them beautifully in this image. Aleo, areo, cranial, caudal. Cranial means towards the head of the patient. Caudal means away from the head. And now these are the other images just to show like how the coronary are. So this is more of a memory aid. This is not really a standard teaching. But you can think about it if you want to really learn it in an easy way. Okay. So this is how the heart, heart cardiac shadow looks like. So if you are trying to do a left ventriculogram in LAO with cranial angulation, the left side and the RAO right side. So you can divide the ventriculogram in different segments. So because you have to also comment about the regional wall motion abnormality. So you can see them as well. So you can divide them into different segments and number them in form of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So as you all can see, these are the segment names are base, apex, lateral, septal yeah and then you can further make it into anterior inferior inferior basal apical so they are literally a little bit similar if you all will remember about the echocardiography so this is very similar to that this is again a memory aid how you may remember the coronary angulation how it shows the left LA, in the LAO view with cranial left side and the caudal right side angulations which you see it over here so this is what how you see in the typical view so this is a CT angiography image a lot of times you will be coming across CT angiography image but how do they look like so CT angiography reconstruction of the left coronary arteries in the LAO view and cranial and caudal angulations and these drawings are, they are showing the images that are seen on the contrast angiography. And these, these images are very important as, a, as we all know, as we all know that it's a non-invasive thing which you can able to not only order, you should be able to interpret these results as well. And that's why these results assume very significant. So this is another further memory aid how do they look in different views? So for example, if you are trying to take a RAO caudal view, as you may see, the RCA will come over here. The LED is of course on the opposite side and the circumflex comes just in the middle. However, if you change the angulation of your view, so if you go to the RAO cranial, you'll be seeing LED just in the front, circumflex goes back, left mean again is in the middle so what is the difference what happens is in the RAO cranial you cannot see the RCA actually so now this is again a CT angio uh, a CT angiogram so when you are trying to you have reconstructed the left coronary arteries in the RAO caudal left and cranial right angulations so this is how the vessels will be looking like. I hope you all can see and remember these color codings. These color codings are referring to those coronary arteries. So this is another beautiful image. So I would really like everyone to practice with your three fingers. How do they look like in the different angulations? Because this will make you easier to understand in which view you are going to visualize which coronary arteries isn't it so with just little bit of imagination and little bit of projection you can understand these things very well and you will never be confused because patients will come to you with your with their CT angios or even their angiographies and you will have to take a decision for that so that's why this is very important as you can see in this diagram very well so what are these cranial caudal LAO are your views as well so this is caudo cranial
Why did you say caudocranial? Because first thing is what is happening is this is going more to the caudal and then to the cranial side as well. So then how would you say anterior? Posterior, right lateral. So the key is always is, as I had said it, your, your position of the image intensifier. Wherever your image intensifier is going to be located or localized, that is the position you will have to say. So what do you see? So I think you, there are some centers I know. Uh, uh, they also have what is called as a biplanar. So biplanar, as you are, may notice in this diagram, so this one is in the AP. However, the other one is in the lateral view. So you can call it as AP lateral. But of course, you do not bother about this thing if, if your center doesn't have. So some of the centers, even for the angiography, they use these uh, devices, okay? So to make it simple in a single diagram, how to see LAO, RAO, AP. So this is how is the different projection, okay? And now, when you are trying to visualize the different branches, we need to know what about the anatomy? How do the coronary arteries look like? So this is the left main stem, which further gives rise to the different branches. So as you may see, this is what is LED, the proximal, mid, distal. Similarly, this is the left circumflex, <coughs> further divided into the proximal, mid, and distal part. So you are seeing these branches. Now, for example, if you if you want to see those perforators, the septal perforators or the distal left main segment and all, so you just have to turn your floor a little bit and you will not only see the septal perforators but also the obtuse marginal branch as well. Then if you change your view to the RAO caudal, RAO, I think you all can understand, right? So, your image intensifier goes to the right side and then to the caudal side, not the cranial. So, away from the cranial. So, in the RAO caudal view, you will start seeing not only the left main, but also the circumflex, the mid and the proximal part and also the distal part. And Sometimes you may see a PDA or you may not see a PDA as well. Similarly, the LED also, you can see those three branches as well. And if you go into the RU caudal view, you may start visualizing the different branches. So this is the reason if you are really trying to visualize the coronary arteries, you must take different multiple views actually. And especially if you are focusing on special branches, you will have to take special views as well. So now, this is a beautiful slide in the sense, if you want to see the different, different views, what are the views you should be taking? So for example, over here, 30 to 60 LED is fine, or LAO is fine, or 30 caudal as well. But you want to visualize this segment, you will have to move further to 30 to 90. Okay, and then when you turn from 30 LAO to 20 cranial, you'll start visualizing this segment. So, the, as I said, this is a very important, nice summary, good slide for you all because in a single slide, you know what views can you get it over there. And also always remember how will you differentiate between the LAO and the RAO. Because, so what will happen is, if uh, your spine is on the right side, then you'll be seeing is RAO. And if your spine is on the left side, then which view is it? So if the spine is on left side, then which view? Right, 
right? Exactly. So it's all about the spine position. So if the spine is on right side, it is RAO. If the spine is on left side, it is LAO. Okay. And now coming back to the standard angiographic views, which we all learned. As I said, so for example, if if you really want to visualize the osteo and proximal RCA, you should go for LAO 30. Don't forget. Rather than you know keep on rotating everywhere, going around and all. Okay, so it's a nice summary. Osteal and proximal RCA, LAO 30. If you go to the RAO 30, you can visualize the mid RCA and PDA. Similarly, if you're in the PA, posterior anterior cranial, you can see the PA and 30 cranial. And you will be able to visualize the distal RCA bifurcation and also the PDA. If you are taking the left lateral 90 degree, you can visualize the osteum of the RCA, mid portion of the RCA, and also the suppression of RCA with its RV branches. So always the common question comes is how do you take an access to the arteries or to the heart? So as you all know, the most common is through your bilateral groins. So using the femoral arteries, you go over there. And then you reach the aorta and further into the coronary arteries. So how do you go into the RCA? As you may see, these are different branches which will be coming out of the RCA. The initial branches, the SA node, the conus branch, and also the PDA branch. So if you are visualizing them, so if you may notice it carefully, the spine is on the left side. So this is more of a LAO view. And this is how you visualize the RCA branch. And let's have a little bit understanding what or how is the basic anatomy of RCA. As we already said it, it originates at a little bit lower than the LCA at right coronary aortic uh, sinus in fact and most of the times as we all know the RCA is part of the right dominant system 85% of the times 85 so almost majority of the times okay although 25% to 35% of the LV supply is there through this branch it may also other as we had already said it that uh, yeah it does give SA nodal branches okay and the first branch is called as the conus artery most of the times 50% of them they tend to have a septal origin okay and it will be going anteriorly and upward towards the over the RVOT and may be an important source of collaterals and the SA nodal artery, which is usually the second branch of RCA, courses obliquely backward through upper portion of the atrial septum, supplying the SA node and RA, and sometimes also the LA as well. RCA, what are the other branches? You may get also an AV nodal artery, right ventricular branch, PDA, and also the posterolateral artery as well. The left coronary artery, as you may see it, what are the different branches which is coming out of the LC? What are the branches which you see? Can you see in the diagram? What are the branches? Sir, LED branches, uh, septal and diagonal. Okay. LC is from one and only two. Great. So, I think, and you are really good in reading huh now let's make it tough how often does it give rise to uh, how often do you see om1 om2 or diagnose we'll give you the answer in the slides okay so what happens is the most commonly the yeah left coronary artery has different branches as well so the biggest one which is called as left main coronary artery it's very short short in the sense it's uh, mostly around 10 millimeter in length and if you really want to 
visualize it because a lot, a lot of times you may be coming across left wing stenosis as well so then you can do is caudal view actually and with the left mean you can also see the LEDN left circumflex ostea okay and the LED branch as we all know it tends to typically go down in the anterior interventricular groove and it usually reaches the apex however one fourth of the times it may not reach the apex and some have twin LEDs like they will be having two LEDs actually so one is for the entire septal branch and another is for the surface LED actually the LED further can give branches okay and almost up to 50% of the LV is supplied through LED branch so that's the reason if someone has had LED occlusion LV can be impaired quite a lot and it can be a big big problem so, so there are a lot of other lot branches of as other well from LED. from LED yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, how to differentiate between twin LED and ramus so as I said it so the I most you can you decrease your uh, yeah microphone it's too long so as I had said it, so LED twin LEDs they will be almost running parallel okay but one will be going for the septal region and the other will be just for the surface LED for the self LED okay so this is it and ramus intermedius is less commonly present it is the as I said it the LED is the main branch okay it will be of course much more bigger much more longer and the ramus intermedius is a rare I would say like yeah only if LED is there only one third of the time so ramus intermedius branches is going to be present did you did you get it Yes, sir. Okay, great. Please mute your microphone. Okay, so now about the left circumflex artery. As we all know, that it goes down the distal left AV groove. And although left dominant system is seen only in the 8% of the times and supplies the posterior lateral, PDA, and AV nodal arteries although what is called as a balance system balance system it's even more rare in the sense the pda branch is going to come from the rca and the posterior lateral from the lcx so what is happening is it, so some branches are coming from the rc some branches from the lcx that's why it is called as a balanced system however in the left dominant system what is going to happen is the left circumflex is going to supply not only the AV nodal arteries, not only the posterior lateral, but also the posterior descending artery as well, posterior descending artery. Okay, as I said it, it's a rare phenomenon. It's not so common, not so often. So, for example, if you do an angiography for hundred patients, out of hundred patients, almost eight percent of those people will be having this. And as we know. The LV, yeah, the LCX tends to supply 15 to 20 percent of the LCX region, oh, sorry, LV region, and up to majority, almost half, when there is dominant left circumflex system. So this is another beautiful slide. So for example, when you are trying to take the multiple different views, what or how do you see? And what do you see actually? So whatever we all have spoken since before. Okay. So you all really need to go back. Once our lecture is over, go back, read about it again and again, again and again. Because this is how it is going to come into your mind. Otherwise, you will keep forgetting. Okay. This is again another view as well how you can visualize the uh, how what are the vessels you visualize in the LEO straight, LEO cranial and RO right. So we had already shown you RCA angiogram in the LEO view. 
and then in the AP view and then in the REO view. So REO view as you can see this is literally becoming almost like a straight line isn't it? And now the left coronary angiogram in the caudal view and then comes the left coronary angiogram in the cranial view. LED versus left circumflex. So sometimes it can be doubtful but I'm not going to ask these questions right now to you guys. As I said it, you need to start getting accustomed to the basic views, the basic anatomy. The how can you see those vessels as well? So then we'll start giving you a little bit tough questions. So this is a Philips system. This is the patient lying down. How you obtain the different views and how the vessels will be seeming like. So this is literally a live uh, kind of image you know how do you get it so then in, you get into the so, so this was ario caudal so this is how you see it then you go to the ap caudal can you imagine how the thing rotates now it will rotate further leo caudal it is called a spider view and then you go to the ario cranial and finally, the AP cranial, and then the LAO cranial. So no, now so far with all these things, I would understand that you all are ha having a little basic description of the what projections can be used, how can you see all those things as well, how can you visualize the different coronary arteries, the coronary segments, and all. So, so far any questions do you all have? So, uh, I was thinking of keeping lesion description for the next session, but we will try to go a little bit further because since we have a bit more of time, so, okay, five or ten minutes we can go. As you all would have read the coronary angiography reports, that what happens is you try to not only tell what are the different branches and which segments are those you know it is a single vessel disease double vessel disease or triple vessel disease how do you say that so for example normally you call it as a, a vessel is disease ideally more than 70 percent however so if there is disease segment, if it is more than 50% and more than 2 millimeter diameter as well, it will be considered significant, okay? And then what you see in these segments, as, as I said it, in LED, you will have to look out for the LED, of course, diagonals, the septal branches. If you're commenting about the left circumflex, left circumflex, obtuse marginal for the RCA, RCA, of course, the PDA, and the postrolateral and then about the LMCA and you should also comment what about the grafts did the patient receive any grafts as well like the Lima graft the SVG Cephano venous graft and about any other thing as well okay if the patient has already undergone any bypass so you must not be able to miss on these things so now what are the parameters which you use for the lesion description? So what are those parameters actually? So what are these parameters are? The lesion description, you have to tell about lesion length first of all. Lesion length, why? The first thing is because you, you can divide it further into discrete, tubular and diffuse. So discrete is tubular is 10 to 20 millimeters in length and diffuses more than 20 millimeters in length. How or when would you say a lesion is eccentric? Any comments? Any comments? When do you call it that the lesion is eccentric? So I would also like you all to follow the Facebook page as well. You'll be getting a lot of updates. 
In fact, that's the reason this page from Facebook keeps flashing for all the students. So what is or when do you call a lesion as eccentric? So, so you call it as, so now you can see beautifully in this diagram how is a concentric lesion. Concentric is more towards the center. However, if it is away from the center, this is how our eccentric lesion will look like. After commenting about these things, you should also comment about the arrangement of the lesions. Whether it is a tandem lesion, tandem means if there are two lesion sets but within a balloon length. However, you will be calling it as sequential, one after the other. That means these two lesions are located at a distance which is longer than the balloon. Further, you may call it as a contour. Contour in the sense, is it a smooth, irregular or there is ulceration present. Ulceration, how do you define? It is more of a, you know, if there is ups and downs, something like a crater and a trough. Okay, which will be of course cause, causing a stenosis as well. Then after that you have to also comment about the calcification and thrombus. So how do you say about the calcification? How do you say about the calcification? Can you see the slides? So I guess everyone is already tired. Hmm? So calcification, you say it as none, mild, moderate or severe. Severe when? Because when you start noticing there are radio opacities without cardiac motion prior to the contrast injection. Not, you know, immediately just take up the case and put up the contrast injection. No. Even without cardiac motion as well, you start noticing there is, you know, a lot of radio opacities. However, you call it as moderate only when you when the heart is you know moving around when you have given the contrast and then you start noticing this so this is what is called as moderate so moderate will be only when there is cardiac motion and after injecting the contrast you notice them okay similarly after that is called as the thrombus so how do you describe thrombus So you describe thrombus on two parameters. One is discrete. Discrete is intraluminal filling defect is noted with defined borders, which is largely separated from the adjacent wall. And contrast staining may or may not be present. Right? So any questions so far you all have? Uh, sir, when we will call native TBD? Triple vessel disease. So, sorry, sorry. Uh, before sir, TB... native 